Twitter wants famous people, but only those who use iPhone. Supercell becomes part of Ten Cent's clan, and your future lettuce might be grown inside of an old nightclub. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1539, recorded Tuesday, June 21st, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT for 30% off your order. And by Atlassian. Unleash your team's potential with collaborative software like HipChat and Jira, which will enable you to communicate and work better together. Visit Atlassian.com to learn more. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we take the tech news and turn it into tech history. Ooh, I like that. I am Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. It's like we're a tech time machine. <laughs> we're, yes. Uh, but we're going forward, not backward. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yes, okay. tech time machine. It's still, it's still traveling through time. It's just at the normal rate that everyone is traveling through time. <laughs> exactly. <basically. laughs> All right, let's travel through time. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Twitter's new app, Engage, seems to be doing more to enrage people than engage them. The app is designed for famous people to stop wasting time seeing tweets and replies from the hoi polloi. It removes the standard timeline and only shows you mentions of other famous people like yourself. People on Twitter, and when I say people, I mostly mean journalists on Twitter are having some very specific issues about Engage, which released today. First, it's only available in the U.S. and only on iOS. It was a very sad mm. moment where Jason was like, I'm going to install that. I'm like, sorry, you're not famous enough. You don't have <laughs> iOS. <laughs> no, you shut me down a little bit harder than that. You were like, you can't. <laughs> that is what I'm I said. Like, oh, that is what could. I said. We should live stream ourselves so people can know that I am not a nice person most of the time. <laughs> you can't. Second, this is the second problem people are having. It's only for famous people, but I think Twitter's been trying really hard to convince us that we're all famous uh, because, you know, that's what Twitter does. You can talk to people and respond and famous people can, you know, follow you, you can follow them. They didn't use the word famous. Instead, mm -hmm. they called the uh, audience engage. They called the people engage creators. <laughs> <laughs> influencers, engage creators. Influ influencers and public figures. <laughs> Okay. Here's the third thing that people were complaining about with Engage. Uh, people had a lot of complaints. Yeah. Uh, these are there's some great safety features for these influencers, but why can't the rest of us have them? So that is a good point, I think. Uh, well, you can have them. Well, I mean, everyone can install it. Yeah, I right. That it. was my question. I'm is... not even like, I don't even have the blue check mark, and I yeah. installed it. So anyone can okay. have it. Um, so I don't know what those complaints are about. But they're, I guess what they're, what they're saying is they should, there should be even better safety features than this. But I get it. Right. Like, if, you're a fa if you are a famous person and Twitter helps you and you don't have the time or interest uh, in spending time just with, like, getting harassed or blocking people <laughs> or <laughs> deleting people. I mean, you yeah. read some of the things, you know, you think... Um, you know, you read the things that famous women post, especially famous young women, and I'm like, how do they even do it? Like, if you read the comments, it's just right. horrible. So I get it. Like, it's nice. Here are some screenshots from from my um, use. It's got it's some helpful information on there. It can, I, you can see this sort of thing on regular Twitter, the impressions, but you can get a little bit deeper into it. If you see, um, so you can see each specific, like, how much, of, you know, on videos, on photos and, and GIFs and other what kind of traffic, you, what kind of engagement, I guess, the word that you would... How many uh, people are seeing mm -hmm. it, how many people are actually at replying you mm -hmm. as a result of it or hearting it. Right. And then you can whatever. see, like, so there's a whole, the column, there's a whole column for uh, important people at replying at you. So anyone... So anyone who's verified yes. something along those lines. Mm -hmm. oh, the, actually, some of these features remind me, uh, rest in peace, of ThinkUp, uh, oh, which was, yeah. you know, Gina Trapani mm -hmm. um, and Anil Dash's a kind of uh, metrics service around Twitter metrics, but also, you know, Facebook and, and a few of the others. Um, and I found that incredibly useful. Of course, I can't play around with this because it's not an Android yet. Mm -hmm. But, um, but you can't. I, you know, yet, <laughs> yet. I'm sure it's only operative. a matter of Yes, it's going to happen. But, but maybe all the famous people have iPhones. 
that's maybe that's what, what Twitter's saying. And they apparently all live in the United States <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it, it looks useful. It's basically a metrics app. What I do find interesting is what you're saying as far as, you know, if you don't have that time to use Twitter as a thing where you actually take in information, but you use it as a tool to put out information, then this might actually be perfect for you. It eliminates the feed, and it gives you a way to compose, and then it gives you all the metrics about what all the people are saying about you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's perfect for <laughs> the person who really thinks about themselves. I don't know. Well, no, I mean, it's the, it, it's the people that... Uh, it, it shows you what everyone's thinking of you, and then yeah. it shows you what the important people are thinking of you, which I think that's, for some people, that's important. I mean, right. uh, everybody uses Twitter differently. Like, I use it to engage with people, to learn, to see what other, uh, what journalists have to say. To I use it as a news feed, essentially. And mm -hmm. I use it to, to for people to say, like, hey, what you said was crazy yesterday, or, you know, what you said really resonated with me. Like, that, that is, like, just to be in touch with the audience. Um, that's why I use it. So I'm, uh, I might use this app, but I will also not give up on Twitter. Yeah, and I and I don't think that it necessarily has to be a replacement, mm -hmm. but it can be if if thumbing through a feed is just too much for you. Right. Know, so. Well, I mean, that's the argument people make when they're being. Uh, when women are being harassed, sometimes people will say, well, get off Twitter. Don't use Twitter. And in a lot of professions, you have to. You mm -hmm. know, you just have to. For sure. And so this is a way that you can mm -hmm. if you just want to be a producer mm -hmm. and not, um, you know, just, just not see all the way people um, are cruel to you <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. I think it's also interesting to me that this was announced at VidCon, YouTube's big conference in L.A., because I think mm -hmm. that's that's more of what YouTube looks like. YouTube is really, here are the creators and here are the consumers in the comments. It's so different than Twitter. It's really a top-down hierarchy as opposed to Twitter where we're all just like jumbled in there together. Mm -hmm. So I think this makes it more like that, more like YouTube. Yeah, and it also kind of like YouTube, like, you know, uh, comments. I think comments across the Internet in general can be toxic. But on YouTube, there is a belief that YouTube comments can be particularly toxic. And there, it's pretty easy to, like, not look at them. You can still be a content creator and contribute to the platform and never see a single YouTube comment. You don't, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. With Twitter, it's pretty impossible to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think what this does is that enables people to kind of bypass that stuff and just kind of get to the meat and potatoes that they might use the service for particularly right. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, another Twitter news uh, also at VidCon they announced that your videos on Twitter and Vine can now be 140 seconds long I thought that was cute uh, and in a future update you'll be able to click a video and go into something called watch mode that's a special place on Twitter for viewing video also Vine will start paying content creators so a lot of new video announcements for them which I think is interesting because we've talked a lot about what Twitter's future going to look like and you know they made those deals with the NFL to stream um, to stream movies and I mean to stream games and I do think video is going to be their video is everyone's future I think but mm -hmm. it really I think that's what Twitter uh, really wants to be their future instant video where everyone's watching at the same time right all different types of video now Vine videos they so I, I realized this right before showtime still the six six second rule on an initial Vine post anybody who um, if you record associated videos for that, those associated videos can be 140 seconds long. And apparently they're doing that because a lot of times someone will create, you know, the traditional Vine video and then link out to a longer version somewhere, mm. uh, you know, and basically pushing that that viewer out onto a different service, say YouTube or whatever. So this way they can kind of control that a little bit more, keep them inside um, the world there uh, as it was. So Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Helsinki-based Supercell, they're the mobile gaming outfit responsible for Clash of Clans and Boom Beach, among many others, just sold uh, an 84.3% stake of the company to China's Tencent uh, Holdings Limited for $8.6 billion. That's Tencent's largest acquisition to date, which they've had a lot of acquisitions uh, in the last few years. Tencent is a major player in China, distributing games on its own WeChat messaging service in the country. That's a tactic that's actually pretty significant considering that uh, services like Google Play, uh, the store, are not even accessible in the country. So they've got it really kind of locked down as far as that's concerned, uh, especially when you consider WeChat's reach of 650 million users in uh, Q3 of last year. Supercell in 2015 made $924 million in profit with $2.3 billion of revenue and only 180 employees. So um, 
I don't know. I think the the big the big comparison that that I think people automatically jump to here is the mobile gaming bubble or whatever you want to call it, right? Like the the automatic let's let's pay un ungodly amounts of of money for this gaming company like Rovio or Zynga that was hot at one time and it kind of fizzled off and and died and I think I think uh Supercell has a little bit of that momentum in their you know to their favor and I I, I can't tell. Nobody knows whether they're peaking right now. That's the impossible thing to know. But I think their business approach is different from the other two. And uh, I don't know. They might have a little more longevity than just great. We bought them for a, a bunch of a bunch of you know a large pile of money, and now they're fizzled out and they're gone. Right. Uh, the company said that they're also the employees are going to uh, the, they're going to retain their independent. They're going to be an independent operation, and the employees mm -hmm. will also get to keep their gold and their elixir. They're gold. <laughs> That's a Clash of Clans joke. Okay, see, I don't play Clash of Clans. <laughs> I am very confused about this Wall Street Journal headline. Apple unlikely to make big changes for next iPhone. Because, yes, the phones will probably be the same size and width. They will also probably lose the headphone jack. And that seems like a pretty big change. Uh, I think I like Neelai Patel's uh, headline a little bit better today. Um, let me find it. Uh, it was, uh, let's see. He said, taking the headphone jack off of phones is user hostile and stupid. <laughs> so. I agree with that. I completely. I think it's a stupid move. Right. So it's funny that the Wall Street Journal said, you know, they're, they're unlikely to make big changes. That was weird to me because that's a big change a lot of people have been complaining about. Um, yeah, getting rid of the headphone jack and everything's going to be lighting in the next mm -hmm. iPhone. The rumor. So, but it's going to be really, really thin as a result, which I don't know. Well, I, I, I don't feel, know how much we really have. So I thought that it wasn't going to be any thinner. It was going to, the battery it was going to have more room for the battery. That was the point. Um, and, and maybe that's not even true. Like, mm -hmm. but I know I said that once, oh, well, make, maybe they can make it thinner um, because, but they have all that space and they can flatten it, but that's not it, I think. Um, so, yeah. I feel like with the design of the iPhone, I don't know, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't feel like people are always are always pushing for a complete redesign. I mean, people are used to it because of the TikTok de uh, mm -hmm. design cycle. Uh, one year on, one year off, and then the next year, boom, it comes out with a, an entirely new design. But the current design is pretty decent, right? Uh, I, I, I just don't know if you necessarily need to break something, uh, you know, or fix something if it isn't broken. But getting rid of the headphone jack. Now, that's not just isolated to iPhone. Um, the Moto Z and the Z Force also eliminated the headphone jack. And basically on those uh, devices, which were announced a couple of weeks ago, it's through the USB-C port. But that requires dong that requires a dongle of some sort, mm -hmm. and I hate dongles. Yeah, I mean, it's just, can you imagine, like, on your, I, I hate them on this big laptop. Yes. On my phone, that's going to be ridiculous. And don't say, like, oh, you, you know, you just use Bluetooth headphones. They're not as good. Like, yeah. they're not, I mean. No, they're not. I, yeah, I, I have a fine pair of Bluetooth headphones for running, but, like, as for people who really like sound and that's important to them, that that's not uh, going to be good enough. So I think... This will be a hard change for some people for a while, but I think it's going to happen. And this this picture is indicative of why the single port, uh, just use a dongle, it makes everything better, uh, is is a ridiculous statement, which is basically a photo of Dieter Bone from The Verge. And, uh, you know, his is that the, the MacBook? That's the MacBook. Uh, with the single, you know, uh, USB or the single port out the side, and a breakout dongle for everything that he actually needs to use it for. And you can kind of imagine that, like, entering into the smartphone world, and that is not a future that I want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's an accessibility issue, too. And Apple sure. is usually really great at accessibility, but this, uh, so, yeah, it's going to create problems. But, like I said, I think it's here to stay. But mm -hmm. these are just rumors right now. We'll have yep. to wait. Absolutely. Uh, we've talked about companies like Kama that are working on conversion kits for vehicles to turn them into autonomous driving machines. A startup called Pearl Inc. is getting into that game, too. But this company happens to be founded by a bunch of Apple veterans, including Bryson Gardner. He's CEO of Pearl Inc. Uh, but back at Apple, he helped lead development of three iPhones and 13 iPods over the course of eight years. 
The problem, Bryson says, is that the rollout of autonomous vehicles doesn't tackle the issue of there being over 1 billion cars without it. On day one, you know, autonomous vehicles are, are put out onto the road. You still have a billion cars out on the road that don't have that. And as such, Pro wants to sell products to bring them up to speed. They're going to start with a rear view camera in September uh, here in the U.S. After that, they're going to follow up with other upgrades and devices to bring the vehicles into uh, the cutting edge. As it were, so basically, this this backup camera actually sounds pretty cool. It's a little expensive; it's five hundred dollars, uh, but it's solar powered. It's embedded into the vehicle registration plate, and uh, the rear view camera is basically broadcast through Wi-Fi to your smartphone inside the the vehicle. And uh, I guess that's just kind of you know the start of of bringing these extra sensors and things uh, to your car. Now, you think five hundred dollars is a lot for that? I don't know. I mean, I've never I've never looked into a rear view, you know, camera and install cars, in my car. So, your cars have you know. them? Well, I have one that only has, um, you know, not a camera, but it'll beep and show, you know, a little shadow uh, if I'm backing up into something. Mm -hmm. But I have always wanted a camera and I'm not big on upgrading my car. So this was, I went right to the website. I was like, I am going to buy that. It doesn't ship till September. But I balked at first at the $500 price tag too. But I mean, that is, that is a really great safety feature to have. I mean, mm -hmm. you do not want, you know, you want to be able to see what's behind you. Like to me, like running over, I mean, yeah, like I, I run over skateboards. I run over stuff all the time that breaks, but like huh. just, you know, I, I, I think what, I don't know. It's one of those moments where I'm like, why do I think $500 is too much for that? <laughs> if you think about, you know, shelling out $800 for an iPhone sure. um, or, you know, whatever you would pay for VR goggles, like this is your safety. Um, so it does, it still does seem like a little high, but, um, yeah, the, that, I think the problem is I don't know what to compare it to, you know, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. I don't know what these, th you know, these right. types of upgrades might normally go for. Um, but I don't know, it's, it's pretty cool tech and knowing the, that the, you know, people who had such influence on pretty iconic devices at Apple are kind of driving the design, you know, uh, that gives you a little bit of. I don't know, kind of hope that mm -hmm. their vision for the future uh, with Pearl um, is bring some interesting gadgets that can hopefully kind of bring us into that next wave of autonomous vehicles. Yeah, and it's a it's an interesting business to be in, right? Because it's like a bridge business. Mm -hmm, basically. You know, we don't we won't need them eventually. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, but we but that is the way we're going to get to autonomous cars. Slowly, we're going to have piece by piece get used to it and used to it more with each new device. Yeah. Until all of a sudden we're you know. Riding around with no driver. Yeah, I mean, for a company like Pearl, um, certainly there's there's this idea of like you're saying a bridge being a bridge device or a bridge line of products that gets you from one point to the next. But I have to imagine if you've been in the business from the beginning doing these bridge products, uh, somewhere along the line, you know, the next wave becomes obvious, and and you're able to kind of take all of that that knowledge that you've gained uh, up until then and apply it to. The next next wave, <laughs> right? But I mean, if you're like, if we're all running around upgrading our cars, like I need an electric yeah. car. Um, you know, my car from 19, uh, you know, my car from 2008 is so old. I just need to trash it and get rid of it. You know, we're not doing great things for the environment if we're yeah, like just yeah. upgrading our devices. If we're getting rid of our car, if we can use uh, pieces to get to upgrade our car instead of getting rid of our car, it's the same thing with you know getting an electric car because your car, um, you know, is is no is is not that old. Mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't upgrade so fast. So I, I really like the idea of these devices. For sure. Here are a few stats about Instagram that might surprise you. Thanks to Josh Constein at TechCrunch for compiling them in his piece today. First, the big ones that Instagram, Instagram highlighted themselves today. The photo sharing site has doubled its community just in the past two years. Now they're at 500 million monthly active users, and that's 300 million daily active users. Instagram surpassed Twitter at the end of 2014. They are currently at 300. Twitter is currently at 320 monthly, um, 320 million monthly users. Uh, since Instagram uh, is a place for sharing photos, it transcends language barriers much more easily than the other social networks. Uh, so right now, 80% of Instagram users come from the outside of the U.S., and that number is growing. That was surprising to me. Mm -hmm. And one announcement that Instagram owner Mark Zuckerberg left out of his cheery celebration Facebook post is that sharing on Instagram is down. Actual sharing is down. And why? Because Snapchat, hmm. I think. I think that Instagram is uh, no longer the place where you just post things uh, off the cuff. 
And especially with, I mean, I don't know if the algorithm will change this, but I know for me, like, I would never post, like, five or six Instagram pictures because I know people are just seeing them, and I don't want to have to, like, I don't necessarily, like, when I have to scroll through five or six of someone's Instagram pictures. Mm -hmm. Like, in Facebook, um, I don't really feel the same way because I feel like the algorithm does the work. So I think people are taking a lot of their sharing to uh, Snapchat. Yeah, I've kind of always felt Instagram was more of a curated image network anyway. So when, when I think of that... I do not think of Snapchat. So if they're, you know, if any of that was being shared on Instagram, I think it makes perfect sense that it would be splintered out. Um, but Instagram gains so much from kind of the effect of just being a being obviously owned by Facebook, but b that kind of cross play between Facebook users and Instagram users and back and forth. It's almost, I think, at this point, kind of assures Instagram a pretty significant line of success just based on that fact alone, because. Facebook, you know, Facebook numbers are just insane and all Instagram can do at this point. It's kind of already proven that it's not this like new network that's going to wither away and people are going to grow, grow tired of very quickly. Uh, and it's tied to, to Facebook success. So that's going to be really good for it. But I do think it's changing because, mm -hmm. I mean, we had that uh, there was a study about people are sharing uh, less personal stuff on mm -hmm. Facebook. Uh, I'm sure that's the same. I think that's the same thing that's going on here where people are sharing fewer photos. Uh, they're there and they're looking at photos, but they're not posting as much. And I think, especially when you talk about the younger generations, they've really heard all the horror stories. Like, they've been listening to us when we say everything you post on the Internet is there forever. Uh, and they've stopped doing that. I mean, that's, what, that's why people like Snapchat so much mm -hmm. um, because it disappears, because there's not this curated, you know, you know, page of pictures that somehow represents your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're moving away from that and people uh, don't, don't want that so much anymore. They want to just communicate with quick photos that disappear. A mm -hmm. uh, little bit unrelated to the actual success of Instagram, but I don't know if, Carrie, you still have the photo of Mark Zuckerberg with the thing that he's holding up or whatever. But if you look closely, you get to you get to see his laptop in the background, and you'll notice when you look at his laptop in the background, there's a little sticker covering up the the camera on the top, and there's either a plug. Yeah, it's the laptop down there. Uh, there's a little sticker up there covering the laptop camera, huh. and there's either a cover or like a piece of tape or a plug over the headphone jack down there. Um, so Mark Zuckerberg is a little little. Uh, Safety conscious. Yeah. And apparently he's also got a bottle of sunscreen there. So <gasps> He's obviously going out into the sun. <laughs> I think we can figure that much based on what we've seen here. It's important stuff. Uh, <laughs> coming up. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just had to put Whatever. It's, it, I, I thought it was interesting that he covers yeah. up his camera. Mm -hmm. Coming up, your next store-bought batch of parsley might have been grown in an old nightclub thanks to technology. But first... Let's take a minute to thank Tracker, the sponsor of this episode. With advancements in technology, we have all sorts of smart things. Smart cars, smart phones, smart homes. Losing your prized possessions, let's say, can make you feel less than smart. And Tracker makes losing those things a thing of the past. Uh, you can put them everywhere. I've got a little tracker tucked away in my backpack in like this small little area of my backpack that I never get into. It's always there, tracking the backpack. You know, I have lots of important things in my backpack wherever I happen to be. So I'll know when I'm not near my backpack, when I leave it behind, it'll be trackable. That's what the, that's what tracker is all about. It's a coin-sized device. It allows you to locate all sorts of things, misplaced keys, wallets, computers, even pets in seconds. The Tracker Bravo is constructed with beautiful anodized aluminum for the thinnest and most durable tracking. Tracker is enabled by Bluetooth low energy, so the battery lasts over one year. And uh, you can also purchase a water-resistant case, and that's perfect if you want to put one of these trackers on your pet's collar. Uh, you can pair Tracker to your iOS or Android device. You can attach it to anything with its key loop or with some adhesive that's provided. And you can find its precise location with the tap of a button. It's really that easy. You can customize two-way separation alerts. That way you're going to receive a notification uh, before you leave your item behind. And if you lose your phone in the other direction, <laughs> you can press the button on the Tracker and your phone will ring, even when it's left on silent. With over 1.5 million devices, Tracker has the largest crowd GPS network in the world. So your lost item shows up on a map, even if it's miles away. If an item goes missing, the Tracker app records its last known location on a map. And when another Tracker user comes within 100 feet uh, of your lost item, 
you're going to receive a GPS update of where your item actually is. Tracker recently introduced Tracker Atlas. This works with your Tracker Bravo or your third-party Bluetooth tracker to pinpoint your items on a customizable floor plan of your home. So you can find that remote under the couch cushions. Save time and energy by simply asking Tracker Atlas where your item is, and you will instantly get an answer. You don't even need to search. Go to thetracker.com and never lose your possessions again. Plus, just for our audience, if you enter promo code TNT, you're going to get 30% off your entire order. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R, thetracker.com, promo code TNT for 30% off your entire order. And we thank Tracker for their support. Finally, our wishes have been granted. If you've wanted your produce to be farmed inside the shell of a former New Jersey nightclub, prepare to be happy. Joining us to talk about Aero Farms and the technology behind their indoor farm is Michael Corrin, reporter at Quartz. How's it going, Michael? Very well. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> Absolutely. It's good to have you here. So uh, indoor growing used to be pretty cost prohibitive. What's, what's changed here? Um, so the primary driver is actually the cost of LED lights, both the upfront capital, so how much do these bulbs cost, and then how much does it cost to operate them? So how much light can you get up per watt? Uh, in the last two to three years, we've seen exponential drops in, in both of those things. So efficiency is uh, way up, and then the cost is, has gone uh, down faster than anyone expected. Wow. So um, how, how effective then are LEDs versus, I mean, I imagine it's been kind of the use of fluorescent lights up until, up until kind of the price is driven down. Is there any change as far as uh, efficiency or, or any benefits there? So they've, they've switched technologies. Uh, they've been using LEDs for a while, but you're right. So CFLs, uh, just incandescents. Uh, which are an order of magnitude in some cases less efficient. Uh, CF, uh, CFLs are, are pretty good, but not close to LEDs. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we've seen that that massive change in, in, in the last few years. Um, and it's being driven by economies of scale, partially, since LEDs are now um, one of the you know, primary uh, bulbs that people are using in their houses, as well as industrial applications. So obviously, um, when you're doing all you know this this type of farming, indoors and in a nightclub, which uh, probably sounds a lot more awesome than it actually is in reality. <laughs> it's just former nightclub. I don't think they're still dancing. <laughs> when I first read this, I was like, how cool is that? They're farming while you're dancing. Dance with your kale, yeah, who see, hasn't uh, always wanted to do that. Exactly. Um, does, <laughs> this, does this type of, uh, type of environment, I mean, does it mitigate the need for things like pesticides and everything? Is it, a, I don't know, is it a healthier environment to be growing uh, this type of food? It's a great question. Uh, and I should add, so it's you know not just the, the cost of bulbs, but the cost of creating controlled environments that mm -hmm. you can grow produce uh, in, in a very precise way. So what we're talking about soon is to actually have plants and lights that are engineered for each other. So you're you're tuning the light frequency uh, and the time of 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 intensity of it to a specific plant uh, species, in some cases a specific subspecies, uh, where you're coming up with varieties that are actually a perfect match for the light itself. Uh, and the, the kind of increase you can get in yield, at least on unit area, is you know, 10 times, in some cases 100 times greater than you'll find outdoors. What about water uh, use? Does it use less or about the same? So yeah, that's a great question. So 99% uh, reductions in the amount of water uh, compared wow. to irrigation. So in theory, uh, also what they're saying, uh, what, what the tests, at least in the CB's prototype farms, is much lower uh, use of fertilizers and nutrients and much lower use of pesticides uh, to the point that they're almost growing in relatively sterile conditions. And when you put that, um, that produce in your refrigerator, it will last for weeks instead of days. Wow, that's intense. Um, any any negatives uh, to this type of farming, environmental so, side effects, that sort of stuff? Yeah, always. Uh, it's not free. Uh, you've got to actually power those bulbs somehow. So mm -hmm. if we're just powering them with uh, conventional fossil fuels, it's not necessarily a, a a huge advantage over doing them outdoors, despite them being much more efficient on, a, on an area basis. So that's a big problem. Um, they still haven't proven this at scale. So uh, this is, I would say, beyond the prototype and the, and, the, and the testing stage. And we've just reached the point where it's economically feasible, but we're not seeing uh, massive acreages that can replace what we're growing in California yet. So um, I'd say energy, uh, proof of concept at scale. Uh, and then I think, you know, there's probably going to be some surprises along the way. 
Yeah, I mean, you can almost envision a future where there are high rises that are nothing but floor after floor after mm -hmm. floor of this type of growing, feeding uh, the overpopulated world. Basically. Run by robots. Yeah, run by robots is probably a yeah, big... That's key, actually. Yeah. They, they, by cutting out the uh, labor costs, you actually make this much more feasible. For sure. Now, you wrote another story today about health apps for our smartphones. I know I've reviewed a pretty decent amount of those on some of the shows on this network. Uh, sounds like the American Metal is, uh, Medical Association is likening this category of apps to digital snake oil. What's this all about? Um, so, yes, yeah, so he's <laughs> he's got a, probably strong opinions on this more than most. Uh, Apparently. My, my, yeah, he sounds like my dad, actually. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, so I think he was trying to make a point and maybe overstating things a bit, but there's a lot of very bad apps out there with poor information, sometimes dangerous information, and others that are just lying about what it is that they that they can do. So uh, they can diagnose skin cancer or uh, can treat you know certain chronic diseases, and, and that just simply isn't the case. On the other hand, uh, people love them. So the idea that you can use an app to to monitor your health, to 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 improve it, is something that people really love. And so there's this tension right now between something that people want and the market is giving them and very poor quality control. Yeah, the person who was speaking about this, of course, was Dr. James Madera. He's the head of the American Medical Association. Yeah, I think it's a it's a difficult kind of place to be I, I, with the, you know, kind of growth in the internet and giving you access to all of you know the world's information at your fingertips and then of course apps and we we feel like we can install these apps and suddenly we have a window into a different you know a trove of knowledge or whatever people want to self-diagnose they want to dive into these things and say and particularly i think it's a cost uh perspective right like uh, insurance isn't getting any less expensive so people feel like oh well i've got these tools that's going to save me a trip to the doctor's office let's say but i mean there's apparently there's inherent danger in doing that as well yeah i think it's all about quality control so mm -hmm. you know the market's very good about uh supplying uh you know the answer answering problems that people have but there it's not necessarily very good at at provide at, without regulation or at least some sort of quality control at, at, at doing the the right the right kind of solutions. So, yeah, right now we're we're seeing actually very good uh, results in some cases where there's um, you know there's studies or there are at least some uh, professional input on the information that goes into these apps. But for the most part, it's wild west. Mm -hmm. So there has been some success with health apps, though, right? Yes. Uh, so things like uh, diabetes, other chronic uh, illnesses where you need to have a regular check-in or you need help to um, to monitor your symptoms and understand if there's warning signs that you need to then go talk to a professional. Um, and those seem to have been very successful. I'm actually doing a story now on artificial intelligence and therapy. So uh, ability to use text messaging with artificial intelligence bots to actually give you feedback on um, sort of any mental health issues you might have or screening you for, for, for further evalu evaluations. But, um, you know, that's probably the minority of what's out there. There's nothing a robot can't do. I know. If there's one <laughs> I, thing I, I've learned doing this show, it's that robots do everything and will do everything <laughs> in the future. Um, I guess the challenge for consumers then lies in just the fact that it's difficult to tell from a consumer standpoint what's effective and what's not. Is there talks about possible regulation along these lines, anything along that line? Um, so, you know, I think the, the AMA actually drew a parallel with the uh, mid-1800s when essentially anything went, anything goes mm -hmm. and you could put something on the market and if someone bought it, then why, then why not? And it, it took almost several decades actually to bring that under control. So they've talked about regulation. Uh, that doesn't seem like it's likely in the very near future. What's more likely is the AMA um, will issue uh, sort of, will start getting involved with entrepreneurs to, to maybe certify or at least inform a lot of these apps uh, at the moment. I think it's buyer beware. And you should look at the source material, um, see who, who's involved with these products. Uh, and if there's not an, a, an MD and maybe just an MBA, then uh, try to think twice. Right. Well, what about the, the in the U.S., there's the FDA, right? I mean, that's what we always hear, that um, there were going to be pieces of the Apple Watch that they, didn't, they decided not to include because they couldn't get FDA approval. Like, I know Google's working on things, um, and it's taking a long time because of FDA approval. I mean, is that, that that's some regulation, right? Or is, are we talking about something different? That's right. Yeah, the FDA certainly could get involved. Uh, to date, I actually don't know, you know, where the line is drawn for a lot of these apps. In many cases, they're providing information, uh, so they may not actually fall under, you know, existing FDA regulations. Um, so right now, it seems like the professional societies like AMA are actually trying to be proactive, get involved, say, you know, these, these are worthwhile, these aren't, this is what we need. 
Um, and, and, but the, the Federal Trade Commission actually has gotten involved and they've been able to establish these, some of these are false claims uh, and then use you know, commercial law to, to go after them. Fascinating. Uh, Michael Corrin uh, from Quartz, that's QZ.com. Thank you so much for hopping on today and talking to us about a few of the stories you've written. Where can people follow all of your work online? Great. Yeah. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter at MJ underscore Corrin. Uh, and if you go to uh, Quartz, uh, I'm always there. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. We'll talk to you Thank soon. You Thank you both. All right, Great talking. Good night. Bye-bye. So last week, we talked about how a city in Idaho had created a municipal fiber network that will let customers switch ISPs in seconds. Uh, Michael wrote in to TNT at twit.tv to say, hey, Idaho native here, heard you struggling Friday to pronounce Ammon. It rhymes with jammin or jammin. famine or backgammon or salmon. Mm, I'm sure we can come up with more. <laughs> I always, I sometimes say salmon. 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 <laughs> salmon. I myself pronounce, uh, and this is still Michael, who wrote in, says, I myself uh, was born in Shelley, pronounced potato capital of the world, but they still don't have fiber. Do, do Thanks, potatoes Michael. have fiber? No. <laughs> potatoes uh, do have fiber. Uh, Right. See, oh, that's so good. Good. I see they what you did there. Mm -hmm. After the break, ebook mm. fans, check your Sorry. email. You might be the beneficiary of an Apple antitrust case. But first, let's take a minute to thank Atlassian, the sponsor of this episode. Now, if you watch the HBO show Silicon Valley, you probably remember that system of post it notes on the wall they had while they were creating Pied Piper. Don't do that. Instead, team up with Atlassian, the makers of collaborative software that lets teams work better and communicate better together. No post-it notes. You can assign, track, and manage tasks for any project, no matter how complex. That's the clarity of Jira. I used Jira in my last freelance project before I came to work at Twit. I have never been so organized in my life. Jira isn't the only product Atlassian offers. You can also create and share content, organize results, and bring team members up to speed with the flexibility of confluence. Instant message or video chat with your team from any device. That's the freedom of HipChat. You can test, review, and manage code in real time. And that is the power of Bitbucket. Atlassian programs are designed for any type of business. Now, our engineering team here, they use Confluence to document equipment and work processes, and they use Jira for managing vendors and organizing our constantly growing pile of tasks. For everything from planning events to working on serious operational issues, we tie our communications together with HipChat. Visit Atlassian.com and see how Jira... Confluence, HipChat, and Bitbucket give your team everything you need to organize, discuss, and complete shared work. Atlassian, helping teams everywhere team up to create what's next. That's Atlassian.com. Uh, just real quick, I just saw this little bit of breaking news from the chat room that uh, Tesla has made an offer to acquire Solar City, which, I mean, Elon Musk had, you know, has a vested interest with. Um, he's related to the guy that runs Solar City, so there you go. But uh, anyways, interesting news. Maybe we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow because I was wondering when that was going to happen. I knew it was kind of on the on the on the horizon and somewhere. Uh, TNT's fan of the day is at Benjamin Ang Benjamining. It's all one word together, so it's kind of hard to read on Twitter. Who says back at the hotel after Cyber Week 2016, but don't understand the TV, so I use my Yoga Tab 3 Pro to watch TNT, and you can see it. I think it, oh, I, that's the yoga tab is actually projecting onto the wall, so that's uh. what we're looking at there, so cool. I love the use of technology to make us larger than life. <laughs> uh, no matter where you are, even in your hotel room, hey, it works. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we're going to find it. Jesse from Richmond, Virginia says he just got seventeen dollars via the Am via the Amazon Kindle thanks to Apple's four hundred and fifty million dollars settlement after Apple was found guilty of colluding with publishers to control the price of ebooks. Now, if you bought an ebook from iTunes, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or Kobo between April twenty ten and May twenty twelve. Check your accounts to find out if you were eligible for some funds from the settlement. Slate says some users are reportedly seeing checks in their mailbox. So if you haven't collected your snail mail this year, now might be the time to do that. Be warned, Amazon says their credit will expire midnight on June 24th, 2017. So buy more ebooks with with your funds. Yes. I think you can buy anything. They're just money. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, then don't because <laughs> look how that worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work out so hot last time. There you go. Yeah, uh, I mean it's it's great, but yeah, they, it's not like yeah. 
It's yeah. not like it's there's no there's not official colluding going on, but it's not right. a, a perfect situation with each. Did books you yet. did you buy any? Because I, I didn't, did not. But, no. Okay. I like the old fashioned books, mm -hmm. and yeah, they yeah no one's caught them colluding on those prices yet either. So <laughs> yet. I got nothing. It's gonna happen in this new day and age of books, in this world we live in where books are everywhere. <laughs> It's the future. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC. I was corrected, thanks to Brian, uh, through email, and I blame Daylight Savings Time for that. I never adjusted for that, so that was my fault. That's twit.tv slash live. You can be a part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. You can also leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. You can find the show on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. If you haven't subscribed yet, go do it. You can subscribe in so many places. You can find all of them at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole, and Greg Burnett, who runs the words, and everyone who helps us produce this show every single day. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone.